In philosophy as in life, there are those Hamletian moments when one cannot be sure whether the claims on conscience are a matter of custom, a dictate of reason, an expression of sincere feeling, or even a matter of taste. There seems to be little dispute but that the taking of non-threatening life is wrong, that telling false tales about another is also wrong, as is adding five to three and getting eleven, not to mention letting a door close in someone's face, failing to give aid to persons in distress, painting one's house in colors likely and even intended to offend the entire community, shouting vulgar statements in the middle of a wedding ceremony, and putting on a jacket that says dry clean only, and, and putting a jacket that says dry clean only in the washing machine. It seems counterintuitive to say not only that all such actions are wrong, but that they're wrong in the same sense of wrong. Some seem to reach the level we reserve for moral wrongs, whereas others are better described either as mistakes or as failures of etiquette or as imprudent. Yet when we attempt to develop a scheme of classification so that we know under which headings to place one or another infraction, well then again philosophy and daily life do present problems. Everyone is prepared to classify a given act as either morally permissible or morally wrong, but soon has difficulty making clear just what in the act or in the judgment of the act provides the distinguishing mark of the moral. The difficulty seems to be based on the hopelessly subjective nature of morals. What is ruled out in one culture is fashionable in another. What is a crime in one historical era or under one set of laws is an act of heroism a few miles down the road. Confusion abounds owing to the subjectivity of morals, we are told. For were moral properties objective, there would be widespread agreement, or so it would seem. Consider the example of slavery. Now citizens in all of the Western democracies would, by very substantial majorities, declare slavery to be morally wrong. Nonetheless, the institution of slavery was not only a fixture during all of Western civilization until relatively recently, but is still practiced in the non-Western world. Surely the ancient Greek world, which developed the philosophical foundations of moral thought itself, did not lack the intelligence or the sentiments that could lead any decent person to regard enslaving others as wrong. Surely Thomas Jefferson and George Washington, both of whom owned slaves, were not deficient in whatever faculties or powers are required to weigh the moral weight of a practice. In many instances, those engaged in the practice of buying and selling slaves declare the practices to be immoral, but so essential to the attainment of some other and allegedly higher good as to be justified. But is it the case that an immoral act somehow gets justified if it leads to a greater good? And if it is justified thereby, are we still permitted to call it immoral? Indeed, if actions of a certain kind are reasonably expected to lead to greater good, are they not for that reason not only permitted, but obligatory? Suppose, for example, you have control over which of two tracks an unstoppable railway car will shift to, one leading to the certain death of three persons, the other to the certain death of ten and you have no choice but these two alternatives. Regrettably, of course, most will state that the choice costing the fewest lives is the morally right one. Suppose further, however, that the group of ten includes one of your closest friends, and that's the reason you chose this alternative. Now, does the act become morally tainted in virtue of the fact that it was based on what finally was a personal interest? But is not moral rectitude itself a personal interest? Well, let's stay with this same example, now modifying the options. Let's say that the runaway train, through no fault of yours, is headed toward the group of ten. You are able to act in such a way as to divert it, but with the certain knowledge that your action will cost the life of an innocent person. Were you to do nothing, your inaction would result in death. But if you do act, there will be a death directly caused by you. Now how should the moral scales move in cases of this sort? If the field of moral philosophy remains cluttered, 
it is not for want of strenuous attempts to bring it into a state of order and reasonableness. And in this noble aspiration, philosophy has hosted a diversity of perspectives. But amidst that variety and the subtle difference and the subtle differences among them, several distinct patterns have emerged. In one of these, the moral terrain is mapped by our rational resource sources, such that the classification of actions in moral terms is based on rational principles, presumably applicable across the full range uh, of, of possible events and independent of cultural values or merely personal inclinations. To commit a moral offense on this understanding is to violate a moral precept and the precept itself can be shown to be valid and binding through a process of essentially rational analysis. Now against this is the tradition so eloquently and influentially defended by David Hume and best summarized by his own words as they appear in his An Inquiry Concerning the, principle of, the Principles of Morals. Quote, the final sentence, it is probable, which pronounces characters and actions amiable or odious, praiseworthy or blameworthy, that which stamps on them the mark of honor or infamy, approbation or censure, that which renders morality an active principle and constitutes virtue, our happiness and vice, our misery, it is probable, I say, that this final sentence depends on some internal sense or feeling which nature has made universal in the whole species." Close quote. The tradition behind this statement of Hume's is that of uh, what I discussed in an early lecture, the theory of moral sentiments, whose advocates are grouped under the general heading the British sentimentalists. The term doesn't mean to imply that they were sentimental, as we now would use the word, but rather committed to the view that our moral judgments originate in a natural sense we have or sentiment we have, innate and universal. It should be noted that this passage from Hume also reaches something found in Thomas Aquinas's moral theory, according to which if our nature were different, our duties would be different. So for all the significant differences between a moral rationalist such as Thomas Aquinas and a moral sentimentalist such as Hume, there is agreement on this much that whatever it is that finally has us judging actions and events in moral terms, it is for all practical purposes universally distributed in the human community. What confers this universality, if indeed there is such universality, is what many moral theorists take to be the universality of the very ends or purposes of our actions. Aristotle concluded that the otherwise infinite regress arising from the why question regarding our actions is avoided by establishing that it is eudaimonia that is the ultimate goal or end toward which all of our actions proceed. It is the that for the sake of which we do all other things. As I've noted, the common translation of eudaimonia is happiness. So the theory boils down to the claim that our ultimate goal, the ultimate goal of our actions, is the securing of some measure of happiness. Well, needless to say, on Aristotle's understanding, not everything that is desired is desirable. And there are some counterfeit or degraded forms of pleasure and happiness that are in fact inimical to eudaimonia. Thus, the better or truer translation, if Aristotle's sense of the term is to be preserved, is, as I've noticed, eudaimonia as flourishing. Our actions have as their ultimate end the most flourishing form of those powers and faculties we have in virtue of which we are the kinds of beings we are. The ultimate goal is that of perfecting ourselves as rational beings. And it's this perfectionist ideal, then, that is reflected in our political and social lives. So pleasure as such is a neutral concept, neither right nor wrong. Rather, the key question is what one is disposed to be pleased or repelled by. To regard any property, moral, biological, genetic, as universally distributed, innate rather than acquired, is with some exceptions to regard the possessors of the property as possessing it essentially. Here's essentialism again. Thus, we can ask, are human beings essentially rational creatures, only accidentally blonde? That is to say, specimen A retains human status, whatever the color of the hair, 
but not whatever the state of the specimen's rational resources. Essentialism is itself, as, as I've noted, a problematical concept, but it's a useful one here to clarify both Hume's theory of our internal feelings or sentiments and Aristotle's theory as to what it is that constitutes a flourishing form of life for us. Now, one point needing to be made in this connection is that moral theorists may disagree on just what it is that constitutes the morality of an action while agreeing that human beings are essentially moral. The philosophical tradition for which Hume speaks is that empiricistic one that would reduce the knowable to what is in principle the subject of experience. If there is some sort of moral reality then, it must be found empirically, its character determined by our own empirical resources. Now let me stay with this tradition for a time, returning now to Hume. He tells us that vice and virtue, these key moral terms, quote, may be compared to sounds, colors, heat and cold, which according to modern philosophy are not qualities in objects, but perceptions in the mind, close quote. Note then that the moral estimations of vice and virtue on Hume's account are not based on anything observable in the external world. They arise like the secondary qualities of color, quality of color from the effect that some feature of the external reality has on creatures constituted in a certain way. For Hume, we are so constituted that actions and events of a certain kind will arouse in us feelings of pleasure or indeed feelings of revulsion. Our moral ascriptions then are grounded not in external reality but in these internal states such that the terms right and wrong are not, in, are not referring to events in the external world but in the sentiments of the observer as these are aroused by events in the external world. Well, let me jump from Hume's 18th century version of this position to a 20th century elaboration of it. Here are some words from A.J. Ayer, the distinguished Oxford philosopher, so influential in the 1960s. Ayer writes, quote, In so far as statements of value are significant, they are ordinary scientific statements. And in so far as they are not scientific, they are not in the literal sense significant, but are simply expressions of emotions, which are neither true nor false." Close quote. For A.J. Ayer, moral concepts are really pseudo-concepts, for they cannot be plumbed for meaning in the way that we can unearth the meaning of terms that refer to actual, real objects in the world. They are not even analyzable, for the analysis itself would require some means of verification, some means by which to establish truth and falsehood. But the expression of an emotion is not a factual truth or falsehood. It's simply the declaration of a feeling. Now more recently, in the closing quarter of the 20th century, there have been further refinements and qualifications of this general outlook. Within the empiricistic tradition, and in the patrimony of David Hume, these all support the famous Humean declaration that oughts cannot be derived from statements of fact, the famous is-ought divide. That is, there is never a logical or rational warrant by which moral obligations can be derived from what is simply a fact in the real world. Gilbert Harmon at Princeton states the case quite economically when he argues that no descriptive statement of fact entails a moral statement. What is common across all of these renderings is an opposition to the thesis that there are real moral properties to which we can have either experiential or rational access. Morality is real on such accounts only in the sense that something is really felt, something is really believed to be so, and this remains the case even if the emotions are universally distributed and aroused by precisely the same facts in the external world. There are then no moral facts as such, only facts, and it is these to which peculiar modes of human sentiment or emotion ascribe moral features. Now for all the support this tradition has gained for itself in recent decades, it's clearly at variance with still other common sense notions about morality. 
After all, when we actually do find ourselves, Hamletian or otherwise, making moral judgments, these are seldom accompanied by feelings of joy or revulsion. Those who judge the practice of enslaving other human beings as morally wrong may not invariably feel anything beyond what is felt when hearing that the sum of three and five is eleven. That is, moral judgments are often of the form, doing X is morally wrong, period. Not that it makes me feel a certain way, it, it's just wrong. Moreover, it would be widely regarded as some sort of mental illness for someone to claim that what makes an action morally right is that it makes him feel good. More often than not, uh, what the dictates of morality require is the avoidance of actions that often and otherwise are highly pleasurable, or even the performance of actions that are in and of themselves highly odious. Sticking one's fingers down one's throat um, to cause vomiting in order to rid the system of an ingested poison really isn't something one finds pleasurable. It might be an action that arouses quite marked revulsion. We wouldn't call it immoral. In all, then, there seems to be something about moral imperatives not included in the catalogue of pleasures, pains, even utility. At a certain level, such arguments also seem to leave little room for a distinction between what is morally right and what we choose on the basis of taste. Of course, there's little in the domain of taste that is universally adopted, but this would not spare the Hume-type theory from classification as a form of moral relativism, even moral skepticism. If, for example, it is just an accident of evolution, and one that might undergo significant change in later generations, that we have a nearly universally distributed set of emotions or sentiments, then the morality arising from these is itself an accident of evolution and may well be replaced by one radically at variance with what we now hold to be good and right. Evolutionary theory has already been invoked to account for altruism and other seemingly ethical dispositions. Well, if that theory is the last word on such matters, then morality as such is simply a word used to classify certain stereotypical modes of social interaction in the animal kingdom. The same rationale must lead to moral skepticism. For if the entirety of moral discourse and moral judgment is reducible to evolutionary pressures and utility-maximizing behavior, well, we must reject some standard of morality that exists outside a given point in evolution and a given species evolving. Morality as a term signifying a class of sentiments or a process by which emotional states are managed or just the expression of feelings designed to facilitate social commerce is a term lacking any real, may I say it, moral properties. Also problematical within this sentimentalist or emotivist or expressivist tradition in moral philosophy is what appears to be its inability to make any kind of moral disagreement possible at all. Uh, G. E. Moore, about a century ago, illustrated the problem this way. Follow this. This is good. Suppose that in judging a course of action, I must consult or be sensitive to certain feelings I have when considering or witnessing such actions. Now let's say that for the course of action X, my feelings are negative or aversive. But for the course of action Y, they are even more negative or aversive, such that I regard both courses of action as morally unacceptable, but with Y being worse than X, right? Sort of a Hume scheme. Now I meet my good friend, Mr. Smith, who as it happens has also been assessing the same courses of action, X and Y. Smith, however, judges Y to be, let's say, less revolting than X. But look, as I have no way of knowing just what Smith's actual feelings are, let alone which is the stronger, and if the stronger, how strong each of them actually is, then I have no way of knowing the extent to which Smith's sense of wrong, or less wrong, or better, is at all similar to the basis upon which I make the same judgments. Nor is Smith able to gauge my feelings. We are, quite simply, unable to find the nodal points on which we might have an actual disagreement, for all we could be disagreeing about are sentiments to which we only have first-person access. 
And if Smith and I cannot plausibly argue, being unable to speak for each other's feelings, how on earth can we refer to those sentiments which, according to Hume, are universally distributed in the community of human beings? Now we might find it more profitable to avoid notions of internal sentiment and consider instead the expression of those sentiments in judgments of utility. Hume recall emphasized considerations of utility in marking out the boundaries of the moral. And his disciple, John Stuart Mill, developed utilitarianism into a full-fledged ethical system. But it is abundantly clear on virtually any formulation of the ism that the very concept of utility leaves the door nearly wide open to all of the traditional moral theories. What we are pleased to identify as useful invariably raises the question, useful for whom? Useful for what? Useful under what conditions? Useful in behalf of what aim or objective? Nor is it helpful to be told that those questions are to be answered by each person individually. For no one has the right to impose standards of utility on another, it might be said, or be told that we might be told that no person has a right to impose, as we say, his personal standard or taste on all the rest, or to be told what is useful by someone else, to be told it's universally the case. But clearly, all this finds us attempting to break a vicious circle by running around it with ever greater speed and seriousness. Of all those who agitated for the abolition of slavery, I recall none basing the argument on the likelihood that more net happiness would result while granting that the abolition would make some quite unhappy, or that abolition would be good for the economy, or that in the long run it might prove to be more useful. In a word, the frequency with which utilitarian factors actually match up with ordinary understandings of moral obligation would seem to make the thesis something of a happy accident from a moral point of view. It becomes a serious contender, however, when the concepts of happiness and utility begin to take seriously what is generally regarded as Aristotle's sense of eudaimonia, but then here the very concept of utility is already nearly a moral one to begin with. Now, in his 1788 Critique of Practical Reason, Kant presented an entirely different conception of morality. It's in that work that he offers the sublime maxim as to what it is that can give rise to transcendental awe, he says. Der bestimmte Himmel über mir und das moralische Gesetz in mir. The starry sky above me, the moral law within me. Ah, Kant. Now on the matter of just what it is that constitutes the good, as in moral good, Kant argues that it must be the good will. Obviously, one who accidentally or inadvertently brings about a morally desirable state of affairs is not to be regarded as having acted morally. Consequences alone can say little about the moral character of the actions that produce them. But the actual will of the actor will tell us all that needs to be said, for it's on the basis of that principle or maxim that is generative of the course of action that we're able to determine if the action has been drawn from the domain of morality at all. Now over and against considerations of desire and sentiment, Kant's moral theory ties the good will to that fidelity to one's duties understood as a willing, faithful allegiance to and reverence for law. But the law in question is not some statutory or legislative encumbrance framed by others. Rather, it is the moral law within me, thus moralische Gesetz in mir, the moral law within me, starry sky above me, moral law within me. As a law, it is applicable in all contexts. It's not a matter of prevailing standards or local conditions or the nuances of the situation. Thus, if slavery is morally wrong, it's always morally wrong, wrong everywhere, wrong under any and every set of social or political or economic descriptions. Just what this law is, apart from its universality, is what Kant would then develop in his concept of the categorical imperative. As a law, the moral law is an imperative. As universal, it is categorical. It applies come what may. It must then be a law that one 
would will to be universal. That is, the very logic of the case is such that if one were able by an act of will to make the universal law of morals a law of nature, one would do so. As mentioned in an earlier lecture, Kant expresses the categorical imperative in several ways, one of them forbidding the use of another moral being merely as an instrument or tool, but always and only as an end in himself. Accordingly, slavery could never be justified on grounds of consequences, good on the whole, the lesser of competing evils, etc. Kant's moral philosophy bases morality on reason and thus reserves the moral domain to creatures who are rational as such. This still leaves open the problem of moral relativism in that human rationality routinely leads to different conclusions on matters of moral consequence. It would be bizarre to conclude that in any moral dispute one or both parties is simply irrational. If both were fully rational there could be no dispute between them. The history of moral thought as written and argued by philosophers is not a history readily divided into rational and irrational authors. It is, however, a history readily divided into debates between moral realists and non-realists, though again these terms have been applied somewhat arbitrarily. Let's try to gain greater clarity. We might consider the realist-anti-realist position noted in the lecture on philosophy of science. The realist regarding the laws of science is one who takes these laws as really operating in the world and not as shorthand for perceptual regularities or abstractions based on some idealized world that has never been. The anti-realist regards the laws as having great usefulness, providing desired economies in our predictions and descriptions, but again as tools of investigation, not as discoveries about reality itself. Now if we use this distinction, we might say that a moral realist must be prepared to affirm the proposition that any complete account of reality must include irreducibly moral properties. And just as the scientific realist regards the properties of the physical world to be independent of us, to be mind independent, so too does the moral realist regard moral properties of reality to be independent of human reason, human passion, human perception. What would then make a moral state of affairs is not that such is seen to be the case or felt to be the case, but just is the case. You know, the same G. E. Moore offered a thesis of this sort a century ago, but in the context of aesthetics. Think of it this way. Take the property beauty and say that in the end it's a relational matter, not unlike harmony in music. Well, if that's the case, then presumably such relational features could and do obtain whether they're perceived or not. After all, absent all human or animal life, it's still imaginable that purely physical events could occur in such a way as to generate patterns of frequencies in harmonic relationship such that a later record of these events would be called by us harmonious though no one was alive at the time the record was formed. Well by the same token we could argue that it's in the relational arrangements of solid objects of oil on canvas sounds etc that the property of beauty is instantiated and that this beauty is not the result of or causally brought about by or dependent upon human values feelings and judgments now the moral realist at least in radical form the moral realist is prepared to argue in kindred fashion that the cosmos itself includes relational features and requirements constitutive of a moral order. Human perception and judgment might pick this up, maybe only faintly and incompletely, though progressively. And if beauty has a comparable independence, a set of properties waiting for the prepared mind to recognize them, then perhaps Socrates was on the right track after all in contending the truth, beauty, and justice were not only real, but finally the same. Well, there are very, very few radical moral realists, though one of them may be nearer to you right now than you think.